Welcome to our second lecture covering chapter three of our textbook. We're going to uh, resume on slide 18, but let me just get started here at the beginning to kind of remind you where we are in this particular chapter. This is again chapter three, and it uh, covers the topic of hospitality business structures. During the first lecture, we talked about um, organizational structures, the various types of business entities that exist. Sole proprietorships, general partnerships, limited partnerships, limited liability partnerships, limited liability companies, corporations, both C corporations and S corporations. Um, and we talked about the advantages and disadvantages of each, specifically how difficult they were to create and maintain, what the personal liability status of the owner was, what the tax situation for the owner was, and how easy was it to grow that particular type of entity. So we are now ready to talk about the second topic in this uh, particular chapter, and that is operating structures. So we're moving um, from organizational structures to operating structures. And we've got a kind of five categories that we're gonna talk about today about operating structures. Let me just put up here the definition of operating structures that we looked at a little earlier, and that is the relationship between a business's ownership and its management. So in our first, um, uh, discussion, our first topic, we talked about um, how the ownership of the underlying business was established. So this is all about the um, organizational structure. And now we're going to talk about the relationship of this entity, however it happened to be a configured, whether it's a corporation or an LLC or whatever, and its relationship to its management. How is the business run? And there's lots of different models that we can look at with respect to that, so we are going to do that. So we're going to go back to slide 18. Okay, and we're first of all going to talk about owner operator structures. This is the most um, kind of obvious, the simplest one to have. The person who owns the business manages the business. So the relationship is pretty close because um, it's the same thing. Um, uh, the, the person who, who uh, person wears both hats. Um, it is another term for this would be an independent operating structure. Uh, there's no paperwork that has to be filed and unless you happen to have a split personality or something, there's not going to be any disputes or litigation between you and you know yourself. Of course, this isn't necessarily the perfect model for every entity because it might be that you have the wherewithal, the funds to invest in this business, but you might not have the skill set or the expertise, at least not in all areas to manage this particular entity. So um, it, it's simple, it's less expensive, but it may not be the best fit in every circumstance. Let's talk about franchise. A franchise is a way to, um, a person that has the, the resources to buy the business model of somebody else and use that business model. On the positive side, it uh, gives that franchisee, the person who buys the business model, perhaps greater chances of success. After all, the franchisor, the person who started the business, um, obviously has met with some level of success, so his or her business plan is likely to um, help or, or, or at least increase the chances of success for the franchisee. In addition, there are many times um, aspects of, of economies of scale involved. Imagine uh, McDonald's, for example, can probably buy uh, potatoes and a hamburger meat at a cheaper per pound price than you and I can at the local Kroger. There's some economies of scale. Plus, there's the ability to have an advertising budget and to have, you know, uh, uh, chefs designing different products and things along those lines. So there definitely are some opportunities to uh, use a franchise situation to increase your chances of success and perhaps in some sense to outsource some of those management functions. But as it's kind of inevitably the case, whenever you, there are some advantages to a, to a particular model, there's usually some disadvantages. And one of the disadvantages can be that the hands of the franchisee, the person who's buying this business plan, are somewhat tied. They can't do whatever they want. Um, if you run a McDonald's, guess what? You're not going to be able to um, serve sushi at the McDonald's. Um, even if you really, really think that 
near customers would like sushi because I'm guessing here that McDonald's doesn't uh, provide sushi and would not approve that kind of a menu for its restaurants. So you can't be as creative or as innovative as you might want. And there would be lots of other uh, restrictions, the hours that you can be open, um, the, uh, the physical appearance of the, uh, the restaurant, things like that, you'd have to be sure to follow. Another reason that sometimes franchises can be less than ideal is that you have to pay the franchisor for using his or her business model. Usually there's going to be an upfront cost, um, and then there will be continuing royalties, and we'll talk more about that. So you need to have some, some funds in order to do this, and you have to be willing to cede some of your autonomy in order to use a franchise. So let's look at what the definition of a franchise is. It's a contract between a parent company, that's a franchise, or this is the company that has the initial idea. We'll call this McDonald's. So think about the franchisors being McDonald's. And an operating company who's a franchisee. This is the mom and pop business that buys a franchise. They don't put their name out front. It's not, you know, Bob's McDonald's. It just says McDonald's. It looks like all the other McDonald's in the world, but this particular McDonald's isn't owned by McDonald's. It's owned by Bob. And that's actually how most fast food restaurants are owned. Yes, there's a few that are owned by the actual um, a franchisor, but most are owned by franchisees. So we have a parent company and an operating company, and uh, the parent company allows the franchisee to run a business with the brand name of the parent company, in other words, call itself McDonald's, as long as the terms of the contract concerning methods of operation are followed. So this means that if Bob's McDonald's doesn't play by the rules, doesn't follow the terms of the contract, McDonald's can sue Bob and say, oh, you can't do it that way. We had the franchisee, this is Bob. This is the person who is buying the right to use the McDonald's name. The franchisor, that's McDonald's. That's the person who has sold or is, or, or is granting a franchise. Yeah, he has the business plan. What's a license? A license is legal permission to do a certain thing or operate in a certain way. If McDonald's do, isn't willing to sell its franchise to Bob, Bob is out of luck because Bob lacks a license to use the name McDonald's. Um, and so he won't be able to successfully do it. If he attempts to do it without having a license, McDonald's will sue it for infringement of its uh, intellectual property, its trademark, its um, uh, uh, copyright. Uh, uh, not, not a good situation for Bob. What's a licensing agreement? Well, this is the agreement that gives Bob the right to use the McDonald's name and, and trademark and things along those lines. So this is a franchise licensing agreement in this particular case. It can also be called a franchising agreement. And as we said before, there's going to be that initial sum that's going to vary depending upon the franchise. And then there'll be some amount of royalties. Again, this will vary from industry to industry, but it can be anywhere from 3% to 15% of gross sales. Notice this isn't gross profits, but this is gross sales. So Bob might well be losing money, but still obviously has positive sales. And so having to pay a premium, excuse me, a, a, a franchise, I'm sorry, I can't watch it, a royalty on that amount of money. So it's not on gross profit, but on gross sales. Who is a licensor? Well, this would be McDonald's. He or she is granting the license. And of course, in this case, the licensor is the franchisor. Let's look for a second at um, uh, this manifestation. We see the words ending O-R, O-R. This is a common legal suffix. And what it means is when you see O-R, you're talking about a person, doesn't have to be a human being, but some entity of some type who is doing the base word in front of it. So a franchisor is doing a franchise. A licensor is doing a license. It works pretty similarly to the ER suffix that we use in everyday English. For example, if I had used the word writer, I mean somebody who is doing a writing, right? Who is writing something. 
And so a franchisor is someone who franchises, a licensor is somebody who licenses. License. And in this context, these are synonyms. There are people who license things that aren't licensing franchises though. So this is the broader term that covers a lot of additional categories. And this is the more specific term um, relating to a particular type of license, a franchise. So we'll see this OR ending from time to time. Uh, if, if it's helpful, just think about the ER ending that's common in everyday English. We also had the EE ending. And this follows a similar pattern. EE means somebody who receives the base word in front. So a franchisee is somebody who receives a franchise. And my guess is you're going to be able to figure out what a licensee is, right? A licensee is somebody who receives a license. Not too difficult there. Um, so in this case, a licensee and a franchisee are synonyms. They mean the same thing. We have the EE ending in everyday English too. For example, if you are throwing a party and you send me an invitation, I am an invitee. I am somebody who's receiving an invitation. So we see that same pattern in everyday English. And again, we have, oh, we have the next slide. Licensee is someone who has granted a license, who has a license. The licensee is the same thing as the franchisee. This is the broader term. This is the more specific term. So we've talked about the owner operator situation with owner operator situation, which is the most simple operating structure. Then we've talked about the franchise situation, which is also a I don't know if I'd say it's super uh, simple, but it's perhaps a little bit more simple than when we get to management contracts. Management contracts are very common in the hospitality industry. Um, a management company is a company that enters into a management contract, right? It's an entity, and of course, it can be any type of entity. It could be a sole proprietorship. It could be an LLC. It could be some type of partnership. It could be some type of corporation. Anyway, whatever its entity status is, for a fee, and it could be a flat fee or some kind of percentage. I mean, there's lots of different ways that this, this fee can be calculated. But for a fee, it assumes the responsibility for the day-to-day -day operation of the business. So it says, let's say uh, you're Bob, you're very wealthy, you want to get in the hotel business. But honestly, you don't really know how to run a hotel. You know this is a good investment, but you don't want to be involved in the day-to-day uh, tasks involved so you hire a management company and you pay them some kind of fee associated with it and then they go out and actually run the operations they decide what the prices for the rooms will be they decide what the policies will be in terms of checkout time uh, they make all of those decisions for your business usually because they specialize in the business they have a lot of expertise and knowledge about it and of course, when you enter into an agreement with a management company, you're going to enter into a management contract, right? Uh, by the way, whenever you see the word contract in this course, I'm probably not going to write out the word contract. I'm probably just going to do a capital letter K. That's a common way for legal professionals to talk about contracts um, in Greek. Um, the uh, the capital letter K has the k, k sound, and so. Um, we oftentimes use that to stand in for the word contract, obviously. In the English language, we use a C to begin the word contract, but for abbreviations, we're going to be using K. So this would be a management contract. So what is a management contract? It's the legal agreement that defines the responsibilities of the business owner, which is, of course, usually to pay the fee, and the management company. What does it have to do to satisfy the terms in the contract? If either one, if the business owner doesn't fulfill its obligations or the management company doesn't fulfill its obligations, obviously there can be a lawsuit because we have a situation of breach of contract. Now let's talk about REITs. Okay, what is a REIT? Well, REIT stands for a real estate investment trust. This is similar in many respects to a limited partnership. It is a type of business structure in which the owners of the business are generally prohibited from operating it. So they own it, but they're silent. They have managers who actually run it. You could have actually put the REIT structure 
under the um, organizational uh, topic, our, the topic that we covered in our first lecture, instead of having it under our operational structure. But for whatever reason, the textbook decided to put it under operational structure, which is fine. Um, so what is so awesome and wonderful about REITs? Well, the wonderful thing about REITs are Favored tax treatment, as we've talked before, this is a huge issue. Saving tax dollars is a major factor in how these deals are done. Um, and uh, these, of course, are restricted to real estate situations. So if you want to um, get involved in, you know, an accounting business or um, an acupuncture business or uh, a whatever business that doesn't involve a real estate investment, guess what? The REIT is not going to be your solution because those types of investments aren't going to have that favored tax treatment that makes these uh, devices so uh, popular. And let's talk about our last one of our uh, operating structures, and that is the condo hotel. Probably familiar with the concept of condo. Condo is an abbreviation for a longer word, condominium. And what is a condominium? Well, it's, it's a, a, a multi-unit facility in which I, the owner, have ownership rights in a particular unit, but I also have ownership rights in all the common areas. For example, there might be, well, there certainly will be hallways, maybe some kind of foyer, elevators, staircases, uh, maybe a garden, swimming pools, laundry facilities, those types of things. So I own my unit and I have a proportional interest in the overall facility. And you can see how it's important when you own a condominium uh, what your neighbors are doing. Because if my neighbor next door um, uses the common areas in a way that I don't like, maybe plays loud music all the time or leaves the area a mess, that's diminishing the value of my property. Now you may be thinking, well, why are we talking about condominiums? I mean, that sounds like uh, that's a personal lifestyle choice. What does that have to do with the hospitality industry? Well, let's go to our next slide to talk about how that can impact it. Uh, this ownership interest that we have can be defined in lots of different ways. One way it can be defined is that I have the ability to occupy my particular condominium unit 100% of the time. I have 365 days a year access to the facility. Or I could have a timeshare arrangement so that I have certain days or certain weeks or certain percentage of time that I have access to my unit. So for example, maybe I have um, in 52 weeks, maybe I have four weeks a year that I have access to my particular condominium unit. Well, that means that there's other people who probably also have four weeks. I mean, maybe some have two weeks, some have eight weeks. I mean, there can be lots of different combinations. But when you add up all these fractional owners, they add up eventually to 100%. 52 weeks out of 52 weeks. And you can see the benefit to this because I might get access to a very nice condominium, uh, but I can't be there all the time. Maybe this is a, 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 a near a golf course that I like to visit a few times a year. Maybe it's near a beach or some other um, item that I find uh, enjoyable to be, but I can't be there 365 days a year because my career or my family or whatever is in a different location. I don't maybe want to spend the money or maybe I don't have the money to maintain two residences, but I don't have to because I can buy a portion of this particular condominium unit. So let's look at what a fractional ownership, what the definition here is. A purchase arrangement in which a condominium owner purchases the use of his unit or her unit for a, a fraction of the year. The fraction can be defined in the in number of days per year, 30 days a year, 60 days a year, 14 days, you know, whatever the amount is, or very specific days or months. Uh, for example, it might be very important that I have my fractional interest um, around my birthday or around my anniversary or something along those lines. Individual, unit, individual units purchased under such an arrangement are commonly called as fractionals. So you can see how a business develops around this. Um, we've developed this condominium, and now we have to go out and sell these fractional ownership interests. I mean, there might be some people who want 100% ownership. Uh, maybe they're retired, or they just enjoy living in this place full time. But you can see how um, 
uh, you're going to have to sell each one of these units multiple times in order to uh, uh, make a profit on, on this particular entity. And you might have other parts of the facility. For example, you might have a hotel or a barber shop or a flower shop or things like that that might cater to uh, the customer base, uh, the owners of the facility. They might enjoy those facilities as well. So you can see how this does become a hospitality um, business at, at when it's a fractional ownership situation. Now, who is going to run this facility? I mean, there's lots of different ways that you can set this up. A common way would be to have some kind of management company manage the facility. Um, let's say it's a, a, a unit with, say, 500 of these condominiums, and there's a restaurant, and there's a bar, and there's a dry cleaning place, and there's um, a swimming pool and a day spa and, and all this other stuff. Well, making sure that you have the right uh, vendors in place, that they're providing appropriate services, that everything is being maintained appropriately. I mean, that's kind of a pretty big job. And uh, many times you want to have people who are experts in that, who have uh, the data and the experience to know, ah, oh, yes, this is a reasonable way to do this. This is how often we need to buff the floors. This is how often we need to do this and this and this. And so it becomes an efficient undertaking. That's one way to run a condominium or really any other type of business like this. But another way would be to have a condo hotel owners association, CHOA. And, and this, in this way, instead of having an outside management company run the condominium, you have a group of these, the owners of the condos, um, they are elected to implement the policies and the procedures to manage the condominium process excuse me, complex. So they are as a group deciding how to make these things happen. And you can actually see HOA, right? It's like a homeowners association. Um, if if you are like me and you, you live in a homeowners association, you know that the residents make many of the decisions. Now they may choose to hire a management company to handle certain things like uh, running the swimming pool, uh, making sure that uh, uh, building permits are, are issued correctly when people want to have a new roof put on or a new fence put up or things like that. Um, but some of the decisions are being made, at least maybe the broad picture decisions are being made. For example, that condo, uh, they might vote on whether they want to have, you know, one nice restaurant and one nice bar or whether they want one nice restaurant and one casual restaurant. Um, and so deciding which is going to be the better path for their particular condominium is a big picture thing. And then once they decide how they want to allocate their, their public spaces, then they might consider hiring a management company to actually uh, rent out the space and manage those types of concerns. Or, of course, they can do it themselves. So now we've talked about the common hospitality operating structures. We've talked about the owner-operator situation. We've talked about franchises. We've talked about management contracts. We've talked about REITs. And we've talked about condo hotels. Um, at this point, we are going to um, end the meeting, or in this uh, uh, particular, we go, in this particular presentation, uh, just a little reminder that if you have any questions about uh, the topic of operating structures, please feel free to email me. Um, uh, and again, I encourage you to come by my office hours so we can discuss this in more detail. I look forward to hearing from you if you do have questions. And we will complete this lecture. Um, our third, uh, we'll have a third lecture on, on chapter three in which we'll finish the material in this particular chapter. I thank you for your attention and have a wonderful day.